Good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jet Life 777, and I'm back again with another adventure for you guys. And I want you guys to join me and just sit back and relax and enjoy the video. Also, uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and put in the notification bells so that way you don't miss a video. So with all that being said, I appreciate each and every one of you guys watching my videos and just enjoy it. And if there's anything that you have a question about, don't be afraid to leave some comments in the comment section. All my social medias also are on my YouTube page. So you can also reach me there as well. So I appreciate everything that you guys do for me and I appreciate all the support. And um, yeah, let's get back to the video and just enjoy it. Thank you. So welcome to the Wiener Museum of Decorative Arts in Dania Beach, Florida. My name is Louise Irvin. I'm the executive director and curator of this incredible collection. And we're standing here at the entrance to the museum where the first piece you see on entering is this spectacular vase which stands over six feet tall. I have to look up to see the very top. This was commissioned from the Royal Dalton factory by the Maharaja of Baroda. The year was 1893, and he was the eighth richest man in the world at that time. And he decided he wanted something truly spectacular for his palaces in India. And so he asked the Dalton artists, in particular a lady called Florence Lewis, to paint this magnificent vase for him. We're very fortunate to have it here in the museum because it's the largest Royal Dalton vase that has ever been made. Weighs over 500 pounds, so it was a great challenge to move it. It comes in three parts, the neck, the body, the foot, and then the two handles are attached. And we're here in our spectacular Ardmore Gallery. Ardmore is a ceramic art studio in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa and we have the most amazing collection of their work. The studio was founded over 30 years ago and a lady called Faye Halstead, who was a ceramicist, began to train local people how to paint and sculpt ceramic art. The studio has grown from just a handful of people to 80 working in her studio and together they've uplifted the community and they've been an amazing success over the years. Uh, they've been discovered in the global design world. Uh, they've been making scarf designs for Hermes. They've been making fabrics and wallpaper, as well as the beautiful ceramic art that you see here. Every single one of these pieces is unique, one of a kind. Uh, there's an artist who works on the throwing of the vessel on the potter's wheel, another who paints the vessel, another who sculpts the vessel, and together they work in partnership. They call it the spirit of Ubuntu, meaning we are because of others. So there's a wonderful camaraderie and sense of commune uh, with the artists that work in the studio in South Africa. So as I was saying in the program, every single one of these pieces is one of a kind. So there's a sculptor who's created this wonderful smiling hippo we call this our Travelers of Africa series, and they started to produce these in 2010 when the World Cup came to Africa. So the idea being that these fantasy travelers are going through lush jungles and grassy savanna plains. Look at the amazing detail of the painting here. Um, many of the painters are young women who have been taught how to do this extraordinarily intricate brushwork. Typically the sculptors are men and the painters are women, but there are some exceptions. Um, and this is a collaboration of all of their skills and talents uh, to produce a unique piece. In the center are all the different animals of Africa. You can see the big five here on safari. 
But as you look further around the gallery, we can see terrines and vases and ewers and even teapots which are modelled in animal form. All of the inspiration coming from the animals and lifestyle in South Africa, and a lot of it coming also from the Zulu traditions like basket making and beadworking. You can see really that the spirit and the rhythm of Africa coming through with all of these fabulous pieces. Color, exuberance, um, this is really what is, comes out when you visit this gallery, as well as the, the wit and the whimsy. Uh, some of the pieces here reflect uh, the inhabitants of the Indian Ocean, which is about an hour or so from the KwaZulu-Natal studio. I'm back again, ladies and gentlemen, and here I'm just giving you a little update. So, so far the museum has been really nice, really great, really good experience, and uh, we still have more to explore. So stay tuned and continue to watch. And I appreciate everybody who's supporting me this far and that will continue to support me. And I thank you guys for all your help. So sit back and relax and we got more to explore. Thank you. Okay, so we're here now in our hot glass gallery where we show the work primarily of Dale Chihuly, who is considered the pioneer of the American glass movement. He started in the 1960s to blow glass in a studio setting, and he taught, mentored a whole community of artists to follow in his footsteps. He opened one of the great glass schools in the country at Pilchuck in Washington State, and many of his gaffers, the people who work with him in the glass blowing process, have collaborated with him to make these extraordinary pieces. As we look along the wall here, we have a whole forest of macchia designs. Macchia coming from the Italian for spot or smear. All the colors of the rainbow that he's drawn out here. And he was inspired mainly by his mother's garden, uh, fully in bloom. So we call this our garden or forest of macchia designs. In the corner, we have our giant flower arrangements, which he calls his ikibana, after the Japanese for flower arrangement. But there's no flower arrangements that we see on this scale typically. Really what Chihuly has done is change the way that we think about glass. We don't think anymore about a glass of water. We think of glass as an art form. The wonderful wall that you see behind, it's one of his Persian wall installations. It was formerly in a restaurant in San Francisco and has been installed here at the museum. As well as the work of Chihuly, we have the work of his gaffer, uh, William Morris, and many other talented artists who'd followed in his footsteps, people like Tutzinski, uh, and also the great Venetian masters who came to this country uh, some years ago to teach Americans how to blow glass in the Venetian tradition. People like Lino Tagliapietra and Pino Signoretto, whose work is also represented here. And we also have work from the community that we are in, in South Florida. In the cabinet over here, we have the coral caverns that are created by a glass artist called Josh Fradis. And as we look around, we see his inspiration from the coral reefs of South Florida. And he's created these uh, habitations which are populated by sea anemones and um, other sea creatures. There's an octopus lurking in the background. As we go along, we can see some of the paintings created by Dale Chihuly. Uh, he doesn't personally throw glass anymore after an eye injury, um, but he inspires his gaffers and his team uh, with these very spontaneous paintings where he can visualize his colors and ideas. Some of his sea forms where he's inspired by the sea forms of Florida, uh, some of his baskets uh, where he makes almost containers on the wall across from us, we see an amazing constellation of stars. 
Uh, this was created for us by an artist in Miami called Rob Stern, Art Glass. And he has done this wonderful installation of stars. He calls these his wind stars. And he's inspired by the universe and by watching the stars at night and takes both the names and the inspirations from all of these influences. We're very fortunate to have an incredible body of his work here at W Moda. I'm going to take you now to see the work of Paul Stankard. Paul Stankard is the master of flame working. He's probably uh, the most famous flame worker active in America. And we have to get up close, uh, very tight to look at his work because what he does is create uh, paperweights and orbs uh, which are made of glass and all the interior is made of glass. If we look closely into these orbs and the paperweights, you can see all the petals and pistils and stamens of the flowers are made of glass. And then he beds them into a crystal encasement. He even populates them with little honeybees who fly in amongst the foliage and also uh, dragonflies. As we come around the corner, we'll see pieces that have his little root people in them, where he has been inspired from his imagination, where he's bringing nature and fantasy together. And we can see in this cabinet here, extraordinary collection where he has brought his uh, root people, inspired by uh, mandrake roots, uh, which supposedly came alive um, and screamed when they were dug from the ground. But all the mysticism of underneath the earth coming with what grows on top of the earth. Nature is the biggest inspiration for Paul, who, as I mentioned, is the master of flame working. And we can see on the video screen uh, the actual flame working process taking place with the petals being made one by one um, on the end of a glass rod. So he's using his torch to create that effect. This is the work of René Lalique that we're passing now. René Lalique is the leading glassmaker of France in the early 1900s. He actually began as a jeweler before he then moved on to creating glass. And he was responsible for creating the most stunning Art Deco glass in the roaring 1920s and 30s. He also made glass more affordable for a wider audience. Uh, by creating different molding processes. But when we look at René Lalique's work, we see the striking characteristics of Art Deco and those trends of the 1920s. He was inspired by the human form. He was inspired by nature. Uh, you can see here the beautiful fish designs, which are also um, his work where he's looking at the wonders of the deep. And now we're looking at the work of Rob Stern again. Uh, Rob Stern, who is the creator of the fabulous stars that we saw in the constellation exhibit. Uh, this is his work where he's studying shells. And also another of his interests is the minutiae of nature, really blowing up into massive proportions, small shells. He loves leaves also. And this is one of his most spectacular leaf vessels where he's created a whole uh, vase uh, formed with leaves that he has blown. We're seeing here uh, one other of his spectacular stars, uh, one of his wind stars. This cabinet here shows the work of Tutzinski. Tutzinski is working with uh, threads of glass, which she assembles together as if she's making a painting on a flat surface. But when she fires all those threads of glass together in a kiln, and when the kiln has reached temperature, she takes the pieces and molds them into all of these fluid forms. So she's created a, a unique, uh, very distinctive process that she's made her own. And music and the sounds that she hears are one of her major types of inspiration. 
The cabinet here shows the work of Eduardo Prado. Prado is a Brazilian glass artist who uh, lives some of the time here in South Florida. And he calls these his cocooned thoughts. Um, they're like uh, graffiti in glass, uh, which he builds up on the surface of the pieces. So this is really a walk through our glass gallery. This is our carnival and cabaret exhibition, uh, where we celebrate the art of having fun. Uh, we look at clowns and jesters through the ages and all the different types of entertainment, um, including the cabarets of early 20th century Europe. So as we look around, we see the characters who have entertained us over the years. If we start at this area here, you'll see the Pierrots and Pierrettes who were so popular in uh, Europe in the roaring 1920s. So popular, in fact, these Commedia dell'arte characters were that people dressed up in their costumes for fancy dress parties, costume parties of the Roaring Twenties. The Commedia dell'arte, which is represented here in these cabinets, was a traveling troupe of Italian players who um, really reenacted um, in a live performance uh, the foibles of humanity. Um, poked fun at the whole institution of life uh, using stock characters. So we see famous characters like Harlequin and Columbine that have become part of our experience. In the corner here, we have a spectacular costume which was made by a lady called Tatiana. Tatiana was a student at the Fort Lauderdale Institute of Arts at the time. Um, and she has gone on to become a fashion designer. But they were given a challenge to make something spectacular for a costume, but using the most basic materials. So this speaks to us by its form. We're not seduced by the, the textures, the colors um, of other more luscious fabrics. In the cabinet here, we see the glass art of Chelsea Russo. Chelsea is a fused glass artist. Uh, she's very much inspired by the human form, um, so she models on the female form and uses strips and ribbons of glass to create her work. She was a fashion designer originally by trade and turned glass artist, and she also now makes wearable glass, which we'll see momentarily. But as we head down this way, we see all the costumes that they enjoyed wearing in the Roaring Twenties. Um, here we are with our masquerade, um, with the harlequins, columbines. People like to metamorphose into butterflies at the time. And for something more devilish for entertainment, they could dress up as Mephistopheles. Spectacular cabinet here in the form of the Art Nouveau styling that was so popular in the early 1900s. And then we carry on into seeing how the history of, of costume parties, when people moved from uh, dressing up as famous aristocrats and royal family members of the past, uh, like Queen Elizabeth I and Marie Antoinette, and this was the sort of rich costume they would wear for the elaborate parties of the 1920s. Aristocracy loved to party at that time, particularly now, of course, everybody has fun, particularly at Halloween time. We're looking now in the cabaret scene uh, from France in the early 1900s and also from Weimar, Berlin, where there were lots of louche cabarets. Here we have in the corner the wearable glass by Chelsea Rousseau, and you can see that she makes uh, corsets of glass and bikini tops of glass, which apparently are very comfortable to wear, even though um, it might not seem appealing that you can wear glass as part of your costume. As we come along here, we see all the fabulous costumes and performances of the early 1900s that I was referring to. Our video presentations also interpret some of the costumes. And as we come into the corner here, we're looking at uh, the circus and the jesters and how they have entertained us. Um, you can see here some magnificent tableau by the Yadro porcelain factory from Spain uh, with all the circus clowns entertaining us. 
and up above uh, some studio artists. And as we come round the corner, we see more clowns and we see how the fairs of medieval Europe had the entertainers on the streets to keep us amused as well. So this is our innovations gallery where we explore the most dramatic glaze effects that were created by British ceramic artists in the early 1900s. This luscious group of red wares is known as Rouge Flambe. It was made by the Royal Dalton Company in England in the 1920s and 30s. The glaze effect, this rich lustrous red, was inspired by a Chinese glaze effect the flambe effect of the Orient. But it was a challenge for the British potters to know exactly how you get these rich glaze achievements. So they had to experiment, a lot of trial and error going into the effect. But the results are truly magnificent and this was one of the main luxury wares of the 1920s and 30s. Each piece is hand-painted and then the, the luscious red glaze applied. It was all trial and error. It also had to do with the vagaries of the kiln, which way the wind was blowing. What they discovered was that copper, which would normally turn green when fired, if you take the oxygen out of the kiln, it will turn red. But making all of this palette of colors with rich reds and greens and yellows and lavenders quite a technical achievement, which is why this is one of the highlights of our innovations gallery.